the exact sacred instant, I inscribed these final words. Huddled over in my cell, and overcome with tears at the memory of my beloved father, a tiny sparrow came to the window and began to tap on the pane. Its wings were drenched. It was cold. I got up to let it in, and it was you, Father Francis. It was you, dressed as a tiny sparrow. My name is Lawrence Larkin, and I am an actor. It was a character that I was cast to play that brought my attention to Nikos Kazantzakis' novel, God's Pauper. The character was a Franciscan friar, and Kazantzakis' novel was about St. Francis of Assisi. To get an idea about a Franciscan friar, I started reading it. The novel took me on a journey like never before. It was a wake-up call to a different level of life. Do you think you'd be able to help me with accommodation and things like that? When I get Francis to on, had started to grow in me. I wanted to go to Assisi, so I called my yes, friend well, Brother Robinson, I, you know, an Indian you. Franciscan who was serving as a parish priest of Sacred Hearts Church, yeah, Whaley Bridge. Um, like Brother Robinson first. was a Let's regular visitor to Liverpool, Liverpool and where and my home is. Well, I'll see you tomorrow then. I've often wondered Thank why you. does Thank Robinson, who is a priest, right. yes, address yes, himself certainly. as a brother? Yes. Travelling nearly 40 miles, I went to meet him the next day. There was an Indian priest with him, Brother Thomas, who was visiting Robinson from Italy. Brother Robinson and Brother Thomas welcomed me. While entering the church, Brother Robinson told me to make three wishes in the form of prayers. It's a faith that goes back centuries. We knelt and we prayed. Brother Robinson's church was small, but it had a grace that was spectral. Or was it St. Francis who made me feel the grace? I spent over an hour with Robinson, who explained to me about the Franciscan spirituality. He suggested I should visit a very old friary in Wales that contained a number of saintly friars and the true spirit of St. Francis. The friary was called Pantasaf, and it takes after the St. Asaf. Brother Robinson made all the arrangements for me to visit the friary and the friars. Those who are following the spirituality of Francis, for them everybody is a brother and sister. So you are my brother, yeah? Although I knew about St. Francis of Assisi since my childhood, I never knew him this close. He was a one-off. He was like me, an artist, painter, writer, singer, troubadour except his sainthood. What was he? What was his sainthood? Days developed into weeks and Francis sprouted his wings in me. One day in mid-September I visited Pantasaf Capuchin Friary. The Pantasaf Friary belongs to the Capuchin family of the Order of Friars Minor. The Capuchins are a brand of the Order of Friars Minor, a religious order founded by St. Francis of Assisi. Pope John Paul II described the Capuchins as one of the richest religious orders on earth, and the Pope said this considering the number of saints the Capuchins produced in less than five centuries. The order has to date 15 saints, 27 beatified friars, and 44 blessed friars. I was greeted by Friar Paul Coleman, who is the Minister Provincial of Capuchins in England. Franciscans first came to this island of Britain in 1224, which was during the lifetime of St. Francis himself. Uh, they landed at Dover and they established their first friary in Canterbury and then in London and then Oxford. And then they spread throughout the country uh, by the end of the Middle Ages. There'd have been a Franciscan friary in almost every town and city in Britain, uh, especially, especially in England, but also, as I say, in Scotland and Wales. And that was by the end of the Middle Ages, but then, of course, along came Henry VIII. It's closing down one of the monasteries, and the first monasteries to go, actually, the first places to go were the Franciscan friaries, because according to the um, English law and according to the 
because of the fact that the Franciscans wouldn't own any property, all the Franciscan friaries actually belonged to the king already. So it was very easy for him to just boot them out. So they were the first ones to go. And, uh, and some, of, some of them were martyred at the time. And so uh, there weren't after that any Franciscans in, in England and Wales and Scotland from there on in tended to be undercover, undercover missionaries. Um, the Capuchins, the Capuchin reform of the Franciscans started in Italy in the 16th century, around the time, unfortunately, when all the Franciscans were being closed down in England. But um, so the first Capuchins who came here to Britain were undercover missionaries and uh, they had to work very carefully. One of our most uh, famous ones from all that time was one who worked up in the in Scotland and he spent most of his life working as a shepherd in Scotland, uh, but, but unknown to the authorities. He was a priest who then, who then uh, administered sacraments to the people. There are several saints who inspired the Catholic Church throughout the first and second millenniums. Some of them have become inspiration to people of other religions as well. People such as Saint Augustine of the 5th century, Saint Benedict of the 6th century, Saint Bernard of the 12th century, and Saint Francis of Assisi of the 13th century, and several others after him. Although all these saints have been great reformers of Christian faith, no other saint of the church is called Second Christ except Francis of Assisi. There are 17 saints with the name Francis, canonized by the Catholic Church, and all of them consider Francis of Assisi to be their patron. So who was Saint Francis? Almost everything to everyone. There's something about him that, uh, that can um, speak to people in almost, almost any walk of life, for example. I mean, a lot of people today are attracted to the fact that he was really had a great love for creation, for the animals and the plants and the environment. And so he's been designated as the patron saint of ecology. So for a lot of people, that's what attracts them. For other people, they're attracted by the fact that he was somebody who worked for peace. Um, others are attracted just by his joyful nature. Others uh, like his emphasis upon poverty and working with the poor. And, uh, and yeah, there, 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 seem, there seems to be something for everyone. I even once met a um, group of Buddhists. I met a group of Buddhists one day who were saying, oh, a Franciscan, how lovely. We love St. Francis. We pray to him every day. And so I thought, you know, it's even for people of, uh, of other faiths, he, he speaks to them. And I think, he's, I think he speaks to people at root because he was somebody who was totally open to, to God and open to other people and open to all creation. The Pantasaf Friary was a gift of the 8th Earl of Denby and his wife, who was the sole heiress of the property. The couple who converted to Catholicism gifted it to the Capuchin Friars, who were looking for a base in Wales. Before the Friars took over, it was a Cessation Abbey, and it was named after St Asaph. Brother John is the guardian of the Pantasaf Friary. A guardian is like an abbot of an abbey, or a superior of a seminary. The friars came here in 1852, actually. Uh, the church and this house, Denby House, were built in 1850 by Lord Denby, who had previously become a Catholic, also his wife, uh, after meeting the Capuchins in, in Italy. And not only that, but uh, they met a Catholic church uh, in Edinburgh, when his wife was seriously ill, I believe she had TB, and they went up there in the hope of meeting a, a doctor who could help them with that illness, you know. And I believe while up there they met a Catholic priest, so that was kind of a factor. And um, so he married into the family who lived not very far away, and uh, that's how they came into this area. Um, so the church was partially built perhaps almost completely built uh, as an what we would call now an Anglican church. It's this Church of Wales now, but I suppose in those days, an Anglican church. And uh, when, when they became Catholics, of course, they wanted it dedicated and used for Roman Catholic Church. And uh, there were um, lots, of, lots of difficulties um, at that time. There was a great deal of, of, of prejudice against Roman Catholics. Um, in, in the shops, for example, 
Uh, Catholics need not apply for jobs here, you know. And uh, I believe there are even riots in Hollywell, two and a half miles away, because of this, this thought, this decision, that this church will now be used as a Catholic church. And I believe three other churches were built to make up for the loss of this church to the Anglican church. Anyway, so two years later, 1852, a group of friars came here, uh, maybe about five of them from different countries, um, Italy and um, Holland, I think, Switzerland, and they set up a home here in this small, what we call now, Denby House. Perhaps St. Francis is well known to people for the prayer he lived, make me a channel of your peace. Even people who do not know his name know this prayer. Popularly known as the Peace Prayer, it is used not just by Christians alone, but people from many other faiths. Brother John interpreted the Peace Prayer to me. St. Francis, he had a greeting. Whenever he met anyone, went to any town, he said, peace and goodness. So he had found the peace of God and the goodness of God. And this was in his heart. And that's what he wanted to bring to everyone. So that's what really the peace prayer is about, is finding that peace with God and becoming a, a new person, letting go of, of uh, different things which annoy us, maybe uh, we get wound up, but finding that way to have peace in our hearts and then we can bring that peace to other people. Um, I've learned the serenity prayer, which is quite similar to the, this, this prayer. And it says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So sometimes we find that we're in situations which really wind us up. The words of the prayer are eternal, as it contains the secrets to human happiness, which is the fullness of spiritual life. The words of the prayer are, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. How in the world could this man live this prayer? How could he overcome all obstacles and give himself completely to God? How could he call everything around him brother and sister? Francis has taken me to a new level of understanding of human life. He has shown with his life that such a life is possible for a human being. He has provided useful notes with his life for people like me to understand the meaning of the lines he repeated moment after moment, my lord, my all. Like Francis, I met a troubadour in Pantasaf, brother Francis. I am a herald of the king I have no gold and I wear no ring And the only sign I bear is within My love for you And my love for him In stable poor my king was born his simple men did it scorn. I am a herald of this king, so I have no gold and I wear no ring. He trod the road of Galilee, from sin and death he said Brother Francis has just celebrated his diamond jubilee being a friar. For him it feels as if he joined the order a fortnight ago. The friars invited me to join them for their prayers so I joined them. They do it every day with no exception. Although Brother John wasn't a singer, his voice at that particular instance sounded angelic. It had the gift of faith. The 
Panthers at Friary has eight brothers who are all assigned to do different tasks. Because the order is of Friars Minor meaning lesser brothers, as Francis wanted it, they address themselves and each other as brothers. I understood then why Brother Robinson addressed himself as brother, despite being a priest. I didn't bother to ask them who was a priest and who wasn't. Pantasaf Friday has a church which is a parish, the parish of St. David. One of the friars is the parish priest. The brothers help the friar priest in administering sacraments. We get a lot of retreats during the year, all kinds of retreats. Um, for example, we have the Divine Will Retreats, uh, given by, led by Tony Hickey. We have um, uh, spiritual um, guidance. People come here for spiritual guidance. We have individual uh, direction. We have the um, Padre Pio Retreats, the First Friday Retreats. But many, many different people come here. We have a priest come from Poland, and he, he talks about also about the divine will. Uh, we have healing retreats, people who uh, uh, speak about healing and, and provide opportunities for people to, become, to, be, to be prayed over, and healing prayers are available. Um, sometimes the whole retreat center is occupied with as many as 50 people. Other times we get, say, two groups of 20 in the two wings, so we're able to do that, to diversify in that way. Um, it's mostly, they are led mostly by people from outside. We ourselves also give retreats. They also have a beautiful cafe that is run by a dynamic friar, Brother Martin. I visited the cafe. You know, we get lots of visitors and people and families and the grandmas. So we've had a really busy summer and it gets really busy. So the manager and we have, like Joan and the girls, they're volunteers. They're just from the parish and they just come and give freely a couple of hours, an afternoon, because, well, basically, first of all, they love God and they love the Franciscan friars and they've got a great devotion to Padre Pio and, you know, and they've got the time and the place to do it and they just love giving, giving back to the community. The Padre Pio Garden in the premises of the Friary is a place of sublime silence. It is often used to celebrate Mass when large numbers of people come, organise spiritual events, and above all, to pray to Padre Pio, saint, and perhaps one of the most loved Capuchin saints of the last century. Padre Pio, also known as Saint Pio of Pietrelcina, bore stigmata exactly like Saint Francis. Saint Francis was the person who literally, you could say, was another Christ. You could say that of St. Paul, but certainly you could say it of St. Francis, so much so that in his very hands, side and feet, he bore the wounds of Christ. That was God's way of saying, I approve of everything you do, your way of life. God stamped him with the marks of Jesus. So Francis was a lover of God completely. Everything God created meant so much to him. So much so that he wrote what's known as the Canticle of the Sun, in which he talks about the moon and the stars, all the animals, water, everything that exists, all given to us by God, and they were to become his brother and sisters. He had a great love for nature. And that's why, of all the people in the world, I am not surprised that the church made him the patron of ecology. Francis gave up his luxuries. He founded the religious order and began to spread the gospel. He truly lived a life of poverty. His brothers understood him. There is a scene in Franco Zeffirelli's movie, Brother, Son, Sister Moon in which Pope Innocent tells Francis, you in your poverty put us to shame. The brothers in Pantasaf and the Franciscan order at large put me to shame. In their nothingness and simplicity, they have a joy 
that is serene. The Capuchin habit's got a lot in common with other religious habits. One of the um, one of the main symbolisms of it actually is that the whole habit, all together, um, if you if the hood is put up and the arms are stretched out, the whole thing's in the shape of a cross. So the idea is it's like you're wearing one big cross covering your whole body. So you know, so a Christian will often wear a little cross around their neck or something, whatever, to show that they're devoted, that their their life is consecrated to Christ. But uh, you know, religious will very often wear a cross over their whole body as a way of saying we've given your whole life to Christ. Yeah. And so that's uh, that's part of the symbolism. And the Franciscan habit is particularly designed to be simple, and especially in the case of the Capuchin habit, it's a one piece, one piece garment, and the only other piece being the the rope. And the rope is again significant because uh, back in the day, most of the other religious orders would have had a leather belt, but leather was, you know, a bit, you know, it was expensive to have a leather belt. And, you know, poor people would usually, for a belt, they just have to use a bit of rope or something. And so that's what the Franciscan friars did. They just used a rope instead. Francis, what are you doing to me, my man? Why are you making me closer to you? Why are you making me bleat like a lamb? Slowly the friary became San Damiano and I became Francis. My heart was overwhelmed with joy and sadness at the same time. Was taming the wolf of Gubbio aimed at me? Was the preaching to the birds aimed at my soul? A mixture of emotions? Sometimes people have a kind of romanticized version of St. Francis, especially say, for example, you know, the saint who talked to the birds. And they don't realize that this saint who talked to the birds, which all seems very nice, was also a saint who worked hand on with lepers and was, you know, dressing the wounds of lepers and working with all the pus coming out of their sores and some this and somebody who would and you have somebody to say who was very joyful and very friendly to those whom he met, but was also very severe with himself that he would that you know he would fast for days on end and uh, you know be very strict with himself in that way, and so I think you know people would you know need to under would need to understand you know you got to know the whole person if you know his whole story and what he was like and and uh, you know both the the bits which are pleasant and the bits which are not so pleasant, then it you know, it, it it will help people to understand. You know, the real truth of the situation also helped to understand, apply him to his example to their own lives, because no, you know, every, all of our lives are full of the, the light and the dark, and good and bad, and pleasant times and unpleasant times. And it's good to know that you know he was a saint who went through a lot of difficulties, who struggled with his vocation and what he was supposed to be doing, and also to realise that yeah, he came out, you know, he came came to it out of in many ways, a kind of a normal background. And, and he was, you know, and he was very much part of his time, very much caught up in the events of his time. He wasn't somebody outside of history. Brother Leo tells Francis in Kazantzaki's God's Pauper, nothing is nearer to us than heaven. The earth is beneath our feet and we tread upon it. But heaven is within us. Maybe Francis understood this and changed his life. With Tao, the Franciscan cross, I leave the Pantasaf with the blessings of the friars and Francis and I'm not turning back because the vision I will see is St. Francis in me and I in him. <laughs>